congregation to stand and please turn to Genesis chapter 6 verse 14 as we first pray and then read the word of God Genesis chapter 6 verse 14 Now, someone is thinking it is Palm Sunday. What is this man doing preaching out of Genesis? Did he not look at his calendar this morning? Yes, I did look. And today, we're going to be talking about the ark. And today is going to be all about Jesus. So fret not, you're in the right place. Okay, let us pray. Now we humble ourselves before God Almighty, whose grace has gifted us and whose love has saved us. Patiently now we wait for thee. You word is a lamp to our paths and a light to our feet. May the Holy Spirit strengthen his servant to deliver a word of truth so that many to Jesus will come and meet. Amen. Genesis chapter 6, verse 14. The NASB says, God speaks to Noah. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. You shall make the ark with rooms and shall cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you shall make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark and finish it to a cubit from the top and set the door of the ark in the side of it. You shall make it with the lower, second, and third decks. Behold, I, even I, am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life from under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall perish, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds after their kind, and of the animals after their kind, of every creeping thing of the ground after its kind. Two of every kind will come with you to keep them alive. As for you, take for yourself some of all the flood of all the food which is edible, and gather it to yourself, and it shall be for food for you and for them. Thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him, so he did. Please be seated. So church, here is a Bible fact. God likes telling stories. God likes telling big truths in a context of a story. So the meaning, the richness and depth of these big spiritual truths are easy to digest and easy to understand. People think, everyone knows about the parables Jesus told in the New Testament. Everyone knows that Jesus was a good storyteller by use of parables. But what many people fail to realize is that God is unchanging. So the same God that existed in the New Testament is the same God that existed in the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, God was telling stories there as well. The difference, however, is that when Jesus told a parable in the New Testament, he took a big spiritual truth and told it by the means of a parable, a fictional story. But when God tells us a parable in the Old Testament, what really happened in the Old Testament was real. It was historical. It happened in real life. But contained in those narratives, contained in those parables, was also a big spiritual truth. So today we are in the book of Genesis, where we just read verses from the parable of the ark and the big idea the big spiritual idea that's contained in the parable of the ark is simple 
everything I'm going to say this morning is going to revolve around one core idea. And that core idea is salvation is of the Lord. The big idea of the parable of the ark is simple. That idea is that salvation is of the Lord. When I say salvation, what do I mean? I mean being saved. I mean being delivered from death as a result of sin and being preserved as a result of believing God. And in the parable of the ark, the ark equals Christ and Christ equals salvation. So if you are in the ark, you don't drown. If you are in the ark, you get saved. If you are in Christ, you don't die. Because if you are in Christ, you are saved. Because salvation is of the Lord. So let's make sure we all know where we are. We're in Genesis 6, verses 14 to 22. These verses describe God's command to Noah to build the ark. Why is Noah building an ark? Because a flood is coming. The flood was an instrument of universal judgment on a world that forgot about God, and the ark was the vessel of safety that would preserve Noah, his family, and animals coming in two by two. So when Noah was commissioned to build the ark, what we'll find is that Noah was a man now out of place, in the world in which he lived. Noah was building the ark, therefore he had a future preference. He was living now for the future in building the ark when everyone else around him was living for the present. In other words, you could say that Noah was not conformed to the world around him, but he was transformed by the word of God. Romans 12, 2. The last thing on the world's mind was the ark. The first and the last thing on Noah's mind every single morning was building the ark. And isn't this ironic that back then, eight people, the eight people who actually believed God, the eight people who actually got on the ark, who would have thought, if you were alive back then, that eight people would have gotten it right and the rest of the world would have gotten it wrong? Who would have thought this insignificant minority would be right and the entire world would be wrong? That the right thing to do would be living with a future preference as opposed to a present preference. And when we talk about the future preference of Noah, this is what the Scottish preacher in the 19th century, Alexander McLaren, writes, quote, The men who lived for the future by faith in God will be found out to have been the wise men when the future has become the present and the present has become the past and is gone forever, while they who had no aims beyond the things of time, which are now sunk beneath the dreary horizon, will awake too late to the conviction that they are outside the ark of safety." End quote. Now why was the ark such a big deal? Simple, because the flood was universal, it was global, and it covered the entire world. The only vessel of refuge for the entire planet Earth was in the ark and the ark alone. And the Bible goes to great lengths to tell us over and over and over again that the flood was global. Genesis 6-7, Genesis 6-12, Genesis 7-4, 7, 7-21-23, 7, and 8-21. Why am I making such a big deal about this? Because there are many people in modern day who will, try, who will try to delude you, who will try to trip you up and say that the flood wasn't global, 
that the flood wasn't universal, they'll try to tell you that the flood was local. And what happens after the flood waters recede is God now makes a promise to Noah. And he basically says, Noah, I will never, ever, ever again destroy the whole earth by water for the rest of time. I'm going to back that promise up, and here's a sign, a rainbow. So now, if the flood was only local, and God now makes a promise never to destroy the earth by a local flood again, what does reality tell us? That local floods happen all the time. Wait a minute. So when some, if someone were to tell you the, unit, the flood in Genesis was local, do you know what they're really doing in a stealthy, subliminal way? They're calling God a liar. Whoa, that's a big deal. The flood was a big deal because it was universal. It was global. It consumed the entire world, and the flood waters were so high, they were 15 feet higher than the highest mountains. That's why... The ark was such a big deal because the flood consumed the entire world. The ark itself was one and a half football fields long. It was 75 feet wide and 45 feet tall. It could house 125,000 animals. It was big. It was a giant floating wooden box designed to keep everything inside the ark safe and floating above the floodwaters. So that's what the ark was. Now let's see what happens in the rest of the narrative. Genesis 1, sorry, Genesis 7, verses 1 to 5. Then the Lord said to Noah, Enter the ark, you and all your household, for you alone have I seen to be righteous before me in this time. You shall take with you of every clean animal by sevens, a male and his female, and of the animals that are not clean, two, a male and his female, also of the birds of the sky, by sevens, male and female, to keep offspring alive on the face of all the earth. For after seven more days, I will send rain on the earth, forty days and forty nights, and I will blot out from the face of the land every living thing that I have made. Noah did according to all that the Lord had made commanded him. What happens next is the heavens opened up, rain fell, the deep chasms in the deep began spewing out water, and the earth, once again, the entire globe was consumed with water. Everything outside of the ark perished. Outside of the ark, death reigned supreme. Inside the ark, Everything was preserved and remained safe. That is the ark parable in a nutshell. Now, what does this mean? I said at the top, this is the parable of the ark. What are the big spiritual truths God is trying to tell us in this parable? Point number one. There was one ark. There was one single solitary ark. Therefore, there is but one means of salvation. His name is Jesus Christ. It's very simple. If you believe in your heart and profess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. It's not about having faith. Faith in general will not save you. It is faith in the single solitary ark Jesus Christ. There were not two arks back then in Noah's time. There were no private contractors building arks in their backyards. There was no arks are us. You couldn't hire someone to make an ark for you. By your own effort, you couldn't have climbed a mountain and said, I'm going to climb the top of Mount Everest and wait this one out. No, because while you were pitched there at the top of the mountain, what would now happen? The water would consume you because it was 15 feet higher. 
You couldn't fashion your own boat because only God's ark survives God's flood. You couldn't swim because you were drowned. You couldn't float in a submarine because they didn't exist back then. And even if they did, the weight of water would have crushed that submarine to pieces. And just to make sure we're crystal clear, I was on a panel this week where someone asked me, Pastor Sadafel, what can you learn from other religions in your limited pastoral experience? What have you learned that other faiths can teach you and make you a better Christian? And everyone else up there was saying they were giving these flowery, inclusive answers, and my head nearly exploded because it's clear that no one had been reading the Bible. Let's make sure, beloved, we're clear about something. There was one ark. Therefore, there is one means of salvation. Jesus Christ. I want to make sure no one has a false sense of security. I would rather people be uncomfortable in the truth than comfortable in a deception. God's vessel is the ark, Jesus Christ. Another belief system, another faith in this parable represents someone outside of the ark that has a false idea in their mind and that person perishes. That person dies because the only way to endure God's flood is in God's vessel. The only thing, any belief system that denies Jesus Christ as the Messiah, the only thing that that belief system can tell you is how to get to the ark. And any heresy that would deny the deity of Jesus Christ is essentially someone not trusting in the reliability, not trusting in the trustworthiness, not trusting in the durability of God's chosen vessel. There is one means of salvation, one ark, and that is Jesus Christ. And why is there one ark? Why is there only one ark? That's an excellent question. And the answer is because salvation is of the Lord. God is the one who decides how you get saved, and how you get saved is in the ark, Jesus. Second point. There was only one door to the ark. There was only one door to the ark. Therefore, there is only one door to God. His name is Jesus Christ. Genesis 6.16, God tells Noah to build the door of the ark. This, there was no side door. There was no basement door. There was no roof door. There was no door in the back. There was one door, and everything got into the ark based on that same door. The Bible protect, protects the idea that there is only one door to God so carefully that in Galatians 1a, the Bible says, if anyone were to preach or teach anything else, that individual is to be accursed. That's not being offensive. That's not trying to be mean. That's trying to preserve people and make sure they understand There is only one way onto the ark, Jesus Christ. One door, one gospel, one ark, one Jesus. Jesus says in John 10, 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Because there was one door, this tells us what? Sinners and saints enter through the same door. Pharisees and prostitutes enter through the same door. Lions, tigers, tigers and bears enter through the same door. Clean animals, unclean animals enter through the same door. And it's not a matter of how you come into the door. It's not a matter of how. It's a matter of if you come in. 
you could have gotten to that door and been in the ark 10 years early or 10 hours early. You could have gotten to the door one second before the door closed. And it does, because it doesn't matter how you got there, it matters if you got there. You could have ran with all your heart, all your strength, all your mind, and skipped through the door. You could have been huffing and puffing about to pass out, not, uh, clawing your way up the ramp to the ark. It doesn't matter how you got in the door. It matters if you got in. You could have smelled like fish walking through that door, or you could have smelled like the beauty parlor. It doesn't matter how you got in. It matters if you got in. And the good news is this. For the past 2,000 years, the door to the ark is open. And that door is one way, so anyone who comes to the door is welcomed in. Anyone who arrives at that door is there as a function of God's sovereign decision. Because guess what? There was no door security in the ark. Noah didn't stand there and look down at certain individuals or animals and say, you don't deserve to be in the ark. Because it's not salvation by Noah. It's salvation by God. When God sends out his voice and draws someone to the door by an irresistible compulsion, it is a draw that no human being can ever negate or no other force in the universe can ever turn away. God is the one who told Noah how to build the ark, and he told Noah who gets on the ark. Human selection didn't play a role. And as Jesus says in John 10:3, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Jesus Christ is the good shepherd, and when he sees one of his sheep, coming to him, coming to the door. He never, ever turns one of his sheep away. And that door is always, beloved, one way. So why is there only one door? The answer is simple. Because salvation is of the Lord. God is the one who decides the door to himself, and that is Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Third point, the ark was the only safe refuge from the flood. Therefore, Jesus is the only safe refuge from the wrath of God. Jesus is a refuge for many because Jesus saves many. And here's the irony. As I said to you before, the ark was big. It could house 125,000 animals. So it wasn't crowded inside. People had space. People had room. There was lots of elbow room inside the vessel itself. So once you are in the ark, there is always liberty and freedom in the vessel that God has designed. Charles Haddon Spurgeon says it best. He says, quote, if you don't want to be in the ark, there is never any room for you. But if you do want to be in the ark, it is full of space. No one is ever in the ark who doesn't really and genuinely want to be there. And here's a crucial point. In Genesis 6.14, it tells us there were many rooms in the ark. There were three different levels in the vessel itself, and there were many different rooms. In the ark, therefore, there would be different animals. There would be different compartments where different organisms would be in different spaces. What does that tell us? It tells us that you could be in the same ark, but you're going to have a different experience. You could be in the same ark, but your journey on the water is going to look totally different than someone else's. The lions laid with lions, the elephants laid with elephants, the crocodiles laid with crocodiles, and here's the catch. It's very likely one type of animal never interacted with a different type of animal. 
And that's okay. Because the thing that defines their safety, the thing that defined their salvation was the fact that they were in the ark. This tells us our Christian experience. We can never expect to have the same experience. But what brings Christians together is the fact that we are all in the same ark. Christians can be, they can have divisions in truth. What Christians never are, are unified in error. In Romans 14, the Apostle Paul even says, there are going to be gray areas in the Christian walk where the Bible isn't crystal clear. And Romans 14 allows for there to be a certain degree of freedom, what? In the ark, in Christ. The ark was a vessel that was built based on what? The word of God. So the contours, the structure of the way we think in our worldview is defined by God's word, but in that word, there are going to be divisions, and that, beloved, is simply okay. There are some churches who may baptize babies, others who don't. There are some churches who believe in a permanent view of marriage, others who say divorce is allowable. There are some churches who say, I'll never, ever, ever drink wine. Other churches have wine with their communion service. And that is okay because that represents different rooms and different floors in the ark. And here's a little key insight for you. Have you ever wondered why church people can be judgmental? Have you ever wondered why Not anyone here, I'm just saying theoretically, theoretically speaking, why church people can be judgmental? Because they think salvation is by their room. They think salvation is by their level. They think you only get saved if you have the same exact experience as them, which is wrong. It's not salvation by a room. It is salvation by if you are in the ark. The prophet Elijah in 1 Kings, one day he was having a fit and he said, God, only I'm left. Only I'm good. Only I am doing it right. And God said, Elijah, there are thousands of others who are mine. Your experience is great for you, but guess what? God is bigger than one room. God is bigger than one church. God is bigger than one denomination. We are not saved by a room. We are saved by if you are in the ark, Jesus Christ. So the ark was the only vessel of refuge. And those who were in it were as safe as the ark itself. The ark did not fail because God never fails. The ark did not fail because his word can never fail. Once again, why was the ark the only vessel of refuge? Because salvation is of the Lord. And God is the one who guarantees safety in himself, in Christ. Four, God shut its inhabit, shut the inhabitants into the ark. This tells us that once God shuts you into Christ, nothing can ever shut you out. This is an eternal assurance of salvation. Genesis 7:16. This is what the text says. The King James says it best. And they went in, went in male and female all of all flesh, as God has commanded Noah, and the Lord shut him in. Let's think about this logically. If there was a lock on the inside of the ark that Noah could lock, don't you think someone would have gotten curious Don't you think someone would have tried to peek out of the window and say, hmm, I wonder what's going on. Maybe around day, you know, 12 or 13, they would have gotten curious and said, what's going on outside? And they would have tried. They would have tried to fiddle with that lock and see what's going on outside. Don't you think that if there was a lock on the outside of the door, 
that whoever tried was responsible for closing that lock would try to get in and make someone else close the lock for them. What this text tells us is this. There was no lock. The person who shut the door was God himself. Now let me ask you a question. If God shuts you into Christ, who can release God's grip? No one. There is an eternal assurance of salvation. When you are in Christ, you are in Christ forever, for eternity. As Isaiah 22, 22 says, When he opens, no one will shut. When he shuts, no one will open. And after God closed the door with his own hand, death reigned outside while life, while joy, while rest, while peace while comfort reigned in the ark. When God shuts you in, that means there's a permanent separation from the outside as you are now in the ark. And Noah and his family were now kept in safety by a power that wasn't their own. So eternal assurance is never a vehicle, is never a means to be boastful because no one shut themselves in. They were shut in by a power that was not their own, God himself. Now, let's ask a question now. Isn't this restrictive? Isn't God shutting us in restrictive? Of course it is, and that's the point. If you're in the ark and everything outside of the ark is death, what's the point of being free to roam about? There is none. God shuts you in to live. God shuts you in to save you. God shuts you in to preserve you. Do you know who's not shut in? The devil. Do you know who wasn't shut in? Adam. Adam was free in the garden. He could freely choose to obey. He could freely choose to disobey. What did Adam do? He disobeyed. What was the result? The fall of the human race. And sin now entering into the world. And there are many Christians out there who may be suffering from spiritual depression, who although they're in the ark, they may feel as if, or it seems as if, maybe God shut them out. God knows we are but people. God knows we are temperamental. God knows we're emotional. God knows we're going to have good days and bad days, which is why God guarantees by his own hand that once you are in Christ, Nothing can ever shut you out. And here's an interesting point. Did the ark have a GPS? Did the ark have a navigation system? Did the ark have any rudders? Did the ark have a steering wheel. It didn't. The ark was a floating wooden box designed for flotation. It was not designed for navigation. This means God shuts its inhabitants in and then Noah and everyone inside sat down and they let God steer the ship. And the same hand that shut Noah and his family in is the same hand that guided that ark for the entire duration of the flood. And on top of that, was there a harbor for the ark to dock in? No. Wait a minute. This all makes sense now. God's divine hand then allowed that ark to rest safely in a place of comfort. And then Noah and its inhabitants stepped out of the ark. Don't we see? Don't we understand? It's God from start, beginning, and end. It's all about God because salvation is of the Lord. Noah's name is fitting because Noah's name means rest. Noah heard God's word. He obeyed God's word. He was therefore shut into the ark and then Noah steps out uh, being preserved in a new creation, in a new earth that was now cleansed of all the violence and corruption that was present before the flood. 
and God was in charge of every step of this process because salvation is of the Lord. And this is why Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation. Jesus Christ is the only door to God because salvation is of the Lord, so we trust in the Lord to be saved by the Lord from the wrath of the Lord in order to find rest in the Lord forever. Salvation is of the Lord. Now, there's not an, another flood coming. There's not another universal global flood coming, but there is judgment that is coming in the future, which tells us the parable of the ark is as relevant then as it is now. And the parable of the ark speaks to two different people. The parable of the ark now speaks to those who are outside of the ark, and wherever you are in the world right now hearing my words, when you now hear about the parable of the ark and you know that God has prepared a vessel of safety, a vessel of refuge, if now you can look God in the face and shrug your shoulders knowing that the ark is there, that now means you have looked God in the eye and shrug your shoulders. For those who are in the ark, we now realize what? There's plenty of space. There's plenty of room. We now have to go out and tell others who are otherwise unaware of the ark, we have to tell about God's prepared vessel of refuge. Because as the saying goes, the good news of Christ, the good news of the ark, is only good news if it gets there in time. It's only good news while the door is still open. It's only good news before the rain falls. And the fact of the ark, the reality of God preparing a vessel, is a reason for hope, is a reason for encouragement, because the same floodwaters that consume the world are the same waters that lift that ark higher and higher and higher up towards heaven. Here's the question I want everyone hearing my words to ask today. I want you to ask yourself, who is your God? And when I say God, it doesn't have to be something that you worship in a house of worship. It's going to, your God is going to be what in your life is the bottom line? What is the ultimate thing that you take marching orders from? And ask yourself, has your God guaranteed eternal salvation? Has your God prepared the vessel of refuge for you? Has your God guaranteed eternity in himself for you? What I'm asking you is this. What has your God done for you lately? Because when I wake up every day and ask myself that, I say each and every day, God died for me. The road that I take to the ark is paved by the, bl the blood-stained footprints of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Has God died for you on a cross lately? And God is so good, that's not a question I can only answer. That is a question everyone who professes faith in Jesus Christ can answer. Because God died. God suffered. God was crucified and died on a cross so that the door to the ark would be open for all those who believe in their heart and profess with their mouth that Jesus and Jesus Christ alone is God. So world, will you be shut in by God or shut out by the world? Salvation is of the Lord. So call upon the only Lord that there is, and you will be saved. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you once again for your grace, for your mercy, and for your word, where the richness and treasures of understanding, the richness and treasures of meaning, and the utter simplicity where you can take big spiritual themes and communicate them to us, O oh Lord, in such wonderful and imaginative terms. 
we thank you for preparing this vessel of grace for us. And I pray, O oh Lord, that you use the words that you have ingrained in your word to use them, O oh Lord, to open up the eyes of many to the meaning of the parable of the ark, where there, no lo there ought not, O oh Lord, to be despair, there ought not to be hopelessness, there ought not to be depression, and there ought not to be sadness. For the door, Almighty God, is open. You are the shepherd who sends out your voice and draw them in, O Lord, so people of all colors and creeds from all four corners of the earth shall run, shall flee to the vessel of refuge, which God and God alone has prepared for those to whom he calls. Blessed be the name of the Lord, and we thank you, God our Father. Amen.